And um, I would go and introduce our keynote speaker, Barbara Horowitz. She's a medical doctor and a visiting professor at Harvard University Department of Human Evolutionary Biology and professor of medicine in the UCLA Division of Cardiology. She co-directs this UCLA Evolutionary Medicine Program. In her work, she studies a diverse range of animals in their natural settings to uncover evolved adaptions with potential relevance to human health challenges. And um, she has used this approach to better understand heart failure and sudden cardiac death, neurological conditions, including seizures, dementia and uh, movement disorders, infertility and psychiatric conditions, including anxiety, compulsive and eating disorders. So thank you, Barbara, for being here with us and giving the speech. We are looking forward to it. You're on, Barbara. Okay, wonderful. Let me just, um, fantastic, go to, all right, are you, is uh, technically you can see the screen? Yes. Wonderful. Well, good morning and um, thank you so much for inviting me to keynote this event. I'm, I'm not only honored, I'm really excited to learn a great deal. Uh, the topic of my, um, talk this morning is the, the crucial connection between humans, animals, and non-communicable diseases beyond zoonoses. And um, I am hoping to um, share with you some of my more recent thinking about where my field, the field of human medicine, um, needs to be moving um, to really uh, accomplish what all of us want to. Um, so here we go. In the summer of 1999, uh, hundreds of crows started falling from the skies of New York, landing on sidewalks, hobbling around and, and dying. Tracy McNamara, who at that time was um, a veterinarian at the Bronx Zoo, over here on the right, this is a, an old picture of the Bronx Zoo, and a, a pathologist, a veterinary pathologist, um, she felt a stab of dread. Uh, Tracy knew that when birds start dying in the summer, that can mean something very serious. And of course, um, only weeks later, um, her birds in, in, at the zoo, a, a range of exotic bird species began dying. Um, and during this period, she was also following what was happening locally in the newspapers, and she was reading about um, deaths of elderly residents of nearby Queens. And she really became concerned that there was a connection potentially between what was happening with her birds at the zoo, the crows, and of course, um, the people who were dying. Um, the CDC did send in um, a team of epidemiologists to look into the uh, nursing home deaths, the elderly um, deaths, and ultimately concluded that it was St. Louis encephalitis. Um, and at that point, Tracy really got worried. She knew, uh, as a veterinary pathologist, that when that St. Louis encephalitis, um, that although birds were involved, the birds typically didn't get sick. Uh, the mosquitoes would feed on an infected bird and feed on a human or another mammal or another animal, but uh, that you typically had asymptomatic birds. But Tracy had barrels of dead birds. And so she reached out um, to the CDC uh, to let them know about what was happening. And um, it's a long story, which I'll condense. Uh, I've, I've interviewed Tracy quite a lot about this and had many conversations about what she thinks happened. Uh, why what happened happened, but she was not met with the reception that she wanted. Um, she was initially uh, kind of told that, you know, that was okay, she could keep her birds and that what the CDC was working on was human disease and, and um, she felt, she reported condescended to, um, not welcome. And um, ultimately, this was, uh, Ultimately, these were the, um, the nursing home residents. Ultimately, she ended up reaching out to a USDA lab in Iowa, and along with um, an army lab at Fort, Fort Detrick, they um, were able to identify this as a flavivirus. And of course, this is the story 
behind the identification of West Nile virus uh, in the Western Hemisphere for the first time. And um, this is a story probably many of you know, but I think it has incredible um, salience, not only in terms of the current COVID scenario, but also in terms of how we think about the connection between human and animal health beyond zoonoses. The delay in making the appropriate diagnosis, it's not really known if there were human lives that were lost as a, con as a consequence of this. However, um, about a year after these events, the um, US General Accounting Office um, submitted a report. Actually, the US General Accounting Office became the, um, the uh, GAO. But in that report, there were two quotes that I've pulled out. Um, these were recommendations and observations from the experience. The first was, this experience can serve as a source of lessons. But the second was, the veterinary community should not be overlooked. Now, and this feels kind of like a soft pedal, um, but that was the quote, the veterinary community should not be overlooked. Well, has, have these recommendations been, been taken? Um, are we in better shape now 20 years later? And the answer is yes, definitely, and no. In 2020, what is the relationship between human medicine and veterinary medicine? Well, certainly compared to what was happening in 1999, uh, there has been a, a, a radical change in terms of our awareness of the important connections between humans and animals in terms of zoonoses. And despite some of the problems associated with COVID, um, a tremendous amount uh, has happened um, since 1999. I mean, uh, I'm sure there are people who are um, attending this and on the panel who know this history better than I do, but the National Center for Emerging um, and Zoonotic Diseases um, and predict, I mean, the surveillance of, of, of animals in their natural settings um, for infectious diseases, that is very different. But what about non-infectious diseases? Or more broadly asked, what do physicians, and I'm really talking about clinicians, practitioners, but also physician investigators really know about the health of non-human animals? Well, when it comes to non-communicable diseases in other species and by NCDs, which is how I'll refer to them for the rest of this lecture, I'm talking, of course, about cardiovascular diseases, pulmonary diseases, diabetes, type 2, cancer, and of course, mental illnesses. And there are others, but these are the five um, core disorders. And remember, NCDs are the leading cause of human death. Um, approximately 71%, possibly more, of all human deaths, despite um, the emergence of some new um, communicable diseases, NCDs remain the leading cause of death. So what is the state of physician knowledge about NCDs, these killers of their patients, in other species? Well, it could be a lot better. And this morning, I'm going to make the case that by taking a broader, more comparative approach to NCDs, and by understanding them in an evolutionary context, physicians and the human medical profession can increase their scientific insights. And not only in terms of, um, of the, the genetics of these diseases, but especially the environmental um, contributors to these diseases, accelerate biomedical innovation, particularly through the identification of naturally occurring animal models of resilience, of resistance, and in some cases, the identification of natural animal models with enhanced vulnerability, and provide more effective environmental protection, and crucially, foster a new culture in medicine and health, a culture that moves beyond long-standing traditions of human exceptionalism that have acted as a blindfold that have prevented us from recognizing connections across species 
that can spark innovation. Well, that's a lot to, to promise in a, a short lecture. So here's the plan this morning. Um, I'm going to quickly take you through my own journey uh, uh, just by way of, um, because I see myself kind of as a typical physician uh, who uh, has had this insight, but I, I understand where our blind spots are. And then I'm going to share just briefly um, some sort of picturesque examples of how this approach can um, really transform how physicians understand something as major as heart disease and mental illness. <clears throat> and um, as I share my journey with you, um, you'll understand why I've chosen those two um, categories. And finally, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, the natural animal models that I'm interested in and the quote unquote nature of innovation. So I began um, my post-medical school career actually as a psychiatrist. Um, I graduated from medical school at UC San Francisco in 1987 and came back home to Los Angeles and did a psychiatry residency and then a chief residency in psychiatry. Um, and then for a year, I, I wasn't attending. But I really missed um, internal medicine and cardiology. And to make um, <laughs> about uh, a decade um, of training uh, a quick summary, I ended up retraining in internal medicine um, and then a fellowship in cardiology and came on faculty at UCLA and was practicing cardiology for um, almost 20 years at that point when I got a call from one of the veterinarians at the Los Angeles Zoo asking if I would come and um, do some cardiovascular imaging um, on some of their primate patients. And um, so this was actually my first non-human uh, patient on whom I was performing a transesophageal echo. And um, this was actually because this chimpanzee had had a, a, a neurological event and they wanted to exclude a, a cardiac source of emboli. This is something that I was doing on human patients um, sometimes a few times a day. So I was very familiar with this. And um, I you know, kind of had an opportunity over the course of several years to um, image a number of primate patients, uh, primarily great apes initially, but eventually um, I graduated beyond the great apes and um, had a couple of cases that were really um, changed how I thought about disease. And one of them was, was this patient. So this, um, this was Cookie and she was a geriatric lioness who'd been at the LA Zoo for quite a long time, uh, who developed a pericardial effusion that was very large. Um, so this is a, a about 500, 600 cc's of fluid um, in the sac in which the heart is contained, the pericardium. And it was creating compromised hemodynamic function. So her heart was essentially failing. And um, I put together a team of veterinarians and physicians and um, at the LA Zoo, we, we did a, a procedure um, to drain and it was very successful. And <clears throat> excuse me, actually, so this was a post-operative check. But that was very interesting to me because although I'd seen pericardial effusions and this physiology in, in hundreds of human patients, I really had not thought about its occurrence in other species. I mean, it hadn't crossed my mind and um, in all of my teaching and um, clinical work. Um, the other case that really made an impression was my first case, Pandora. And um, this was Pandora when I first um, was imaging her, but I did end up taking care of her for quite a few years. Well, I didn't take care of her. I, I helped to, I assisted the veterinarians in their care. And by the way, um, physicians are asked to um, provide some specialty assistance at zoos all over the United States. It's always under the supervision of veterinarians who take superb care of their patients. I just was one of these incredibly lucky physicians who um, had the privilege of, of doing this. And it, it, really did, it really did change my life. Um, that morning when I put the probe down, uh, by the way, this is Pandora. She recently passed away. Um, and uh, just, it's for me very uh, personal because this was a picture on the right of Pandora as an infant when she came to the LA Zoo. And I'm a lifelong um, Angelino and I, um, although I didn't know it at the time, I was actually, um, we came, we went, we visited the zoo frequently. And so I, I feel like I had met Pandora before. But when I put that probe in, here's what I saw. Um, uh, the video has stopped moving on the, on the right, but you can see that essentially, um, I'll show you on the left, this was Pandora. Uh, this is a four chambered heart, an echocardiogram, left ventricle, right ventricle. 
And you can see that there are thrombi, there are blood clots everywhere in the right, in the right atrium and the left atrium. And of course, the same was true um, for my human patient. And it turned out both of these um, individuals had the same form of cardiomyopathy. And make a long story short, um, I'd really, ta I'd taken care of this problem in many human patients, but it, again, I had never thought to ask myself in what other species this disorder spontaneously might occur. I knew about the role of animals in laboratory settings, but I had not thought about the spontaneous occurrence of either pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade, what Cookie had, or this form of infiltrative cardiomyopathy that Pandora had. And I began <clears throat> to really um, become curious about my ignorance. And, um, and I learned, I started learning about One Health. And this was, for me, it was about 2005 that I was, um, my awareness started to change. And of course, um, I quickly learned that Rudolf Virchow, um, the father of modern pathology, and one of the fathers of medicine, who also taught Osler himself, wrote in the 19th century, <clears throat> between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all medicine. And while this is, um, in a sense, obvious, um, it has not really been um, an obvious, um, it has not been incorporated um, as an obvious reality into the lives of most physicians. And so I, too, want to pose the question again, how much really do 21st centuries know about the health of non-human animals? And as I began exploring this question, um, I really realized that there was a tremendous amount that we don't know and that there was a tremendous cost associated with this lack of awareness. I ended up... Um, um, asking my chairman if I could um, work a little bit less or a lot less clinically, and I uh, took several years to research and write um, Zubiquity, which was my first book with Catherine Bowers, um, looking across species at the connections between human and animal health. <clears throat> and um, through that experience, I learned so much um, about how crucial veterinary science, um, evolutionary biology, and environmental science um, are to human health. Um, I also, um, at that, during this period, realized that we did not have conferences um, that were explicitly dedicated to bringing together veterinary communities and human communities and founded these ubiquity conferences. And I'll mention that a little bit later. All right, well, why is there this gulf? Well, I'm not gonna go through the entire history of it, but in a nutshell, there has been a, a, a culture of human exceptionalism in human medicine. And, you know, there are many definitions of human exceptionalism, but um, in the case of medicine, it really comes in the form of unexamined assumptions about the uniqueness of diseases to our species. And of course, the um, sort of a priori um, belief assumption that the health of our species is more important than the health of other species. But that really tracks with a, a larger cultural uh, human exceptionalism um, of grandiosity of our species. And of course, with my students, I love to show phylogenies. It's a lot of what I do. And this is one of my favorite phylogenies. Um, this is a circular phylogenies. And I hope you can see uh, we have the, the metazoans over there, the animals in the north a west quadrant and you see um, humans, my, my cursor isn't working, but I think you can see you are here over there. So we are simply one species, but that's not really been uh, how human medicine thinks about things. So one of the issues is that um, in human medicine, when we talk about vulnerability to disease, we're really talking about vulnerability within our species. So an intraspecific vulnerability. And because we don't talk about the spontaneous occurrence of other of diseases, again, non-zoonotic and non-infectious diseases, NCDs in other species, we don't really think about vulnerability to disease as being a characteristic of our species. We, we, it's not really how vulnerability is, is conceived of. And as a consequence, um, there are these blind spots. <clears throat> 
Now, one of the reasons I think for these blind spots has to do with um, actually a victory of human medicine in the last century, which is the recognition that our lifestyles, our diets, our, um, our environments, um, our practices are contributing to disease. So much so that um, many describe these diseases as diseases of civilization. And um, high on the list is, is a disease of civilization is cardiovascular disease. And of course, also cancers, but in fact, mental illnesses as well. And I only have a few minutes here this morning, and, and so I'm not going to share anything about cancer um, per se, but I think this audience is very aware that our many, many human cancers, high impact human cancers from lung cancer, breast cancer, um, uh, colon cancer, et cetera, um, that the risk of these diseases could be significantly modified um, by by lifestyle changes. But mental illness as well, increasingly we're recognizing there, recognizing there are environmental um, contributors to, the, con contributors to um, mental illness um, and other lifestyle factors. And since I trained as a psychiatrist and cardiologist, that's what I'll focus on. Let's start with cardiovascular disease. Well, modifiable, when you talk about modifiable risk factors, of course, we know that tobacco, physical inactivity, um, unhealthy diets, and actually a harmful use of alcohol all are major modifiable risk factors for heart disease. And recognizing this was a huge triumph in human medicine. At the end of a five day trip from England, the Queen Elizabeth, world's largest ocean liner, pulls into New York Harbor. Aboard are almost 15,000 happy GIs, most of them men of the 8th Air Force, jamming every square inch of deck space for a look at the USA. At the end of World War II, uh, as you see, you know, these soldiers, GIs, were streaming back into the United States, and these were, um, you know, young, healthy, some of them not so healthy, men who had survived battles, um, but they faced, when they came home, um, an epidemic uh, in America and in other parts of the world. But what was happening in the U.S. Um, was that atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, sudden death, uh, were skyrocketing. The rates of cardiovascular disease in um, individuals, in men and women, in their uh, 40s and 50s, um, was significantly greater than it was today, but the causes were not appreciated. It was in the late 1940s that a group of physicians and investigators decided to understand this using a prospective um, uh, study, which was um, based in Framingham, Massachusetts, a town in central Massachusetts, in which they, um, they basically tracked what um, the individuals, what these men and women were doing what they were doing in their lives. Were they smoking? What were they eating? And um, over the course of initially years and then decades, and now um, in a transgenerational um, extension of Framingham, many decades, uh, their health was assessed and their habits correlated. And of course, it was from Framingham that we began to understand the concept of risk factors. Uh, before Framingham, by the way, uh, cigarette smoking was not um, recognized as a driver of atherosclerosis. And um, in fact, uh, physicians smoked. Um, this was a famous ad that is shown that you know more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. So there really was pre-Framingham um, a poor understanding of the concept of risk factors for atherosclerosis. But quickly, uh, within um, several years, cigarettes were, um, tobacco use was um, identified, and of course, um, smoking cessation became a, a major part of, of, of prevention. Um, but beyond that, hypertension, high blood pressure was not appreciated to be a risk factor for um, atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease. And the best um, story um, associated with that um, lack of awareness um, had to do with FDR. So this is this famous picture of um, Churchill and FDR in the middle and Stalin at Yalta in February of 1945. And at Yalta, um, FDR was accompanied by his private, his personal physician who kept a diary. And um, at Yalta, FDR's blood pressures were 
approximately 230, 240, over 130 to 140. So he was extremely hypertensive. Several months later, um, FDR died suddenly of a hemorrhagic stroke. And you can see the New York Times uh, quote of the, the physician, quote, it came out of the clear blue sky, came out of the came out of nowhere. So there was not really an appreciation of hypertension at that time as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Well, um, a lot has changed, thank goodness, um, largely thanks to Framingham and um, studies that have happened um, subsequently, but we now know that there are many modifiable risk factors um, over here on the left. Um, they are, they've been identified and we also know that there are some less modifiable um, uh, risk factors, but the point is this concept of modifying lifestyle to reduce the chances of disease. This has become um, a, a cornerstone just baked into how we approach these diseases. And certainly for me, if someone had asked what the cause of cardiovascular disease of atherosclerosis was uh, back in 2004, I certainly would have said, well, it's, and I would have listed these risk factors. And actually, um, around the same, um, in the 1960s, um, toward the late 60s, of course, the Vietnam War was going on. And um, as these risk factors were emerging, uh, there was supporting kind of confirmatory evidence that um, our human practices were really driving disease. And in fact, uh, this is a very famous um, JAMA article published in 1971 uh, that published the necropsies of young uh, combat casualties from Vietnam. And that uh, many of them, even young men, had quite advanced atherosclerosis. So this really was confirming lifestyle um, modifiable risk factors. And Thank goodness, because there is no question, and regardless of um, what I'm about to say, I don't want to in any way um, uh, minimize the significance of this, uh, this to human health, um, because our lifestyles are significant drivers of, of um, many non-communicable diseases. Um, however, in um, the late 1960s, there was a study that was actually also being done um, that was published in a veterinary journal, um, Veterinary uh, Pathologica, and it was a study that published the necropsy reports of dozens of um, wild hippopotami who um, were being culled in Lake Elizabeth in Uganda, and um, uh, the purpose was not to obviously look for NCDs, but um, one of the interesting findings is that in quite um, a significant number of the hippopotami, there was atherosclerotic plaque in the aortas, in the descending aortas. Their coronaries were clean, but they did have atherosclerosis. The presence of atherosclerosis in a wild species, even now for me as a human cardiologist, is disruptive because the concept of lifestyle is so baked into the concept of causation. Well, um, I have over several years just been really interested in um, collecting um, reports in the peer-reviewed literature of non-human animals in whom spontaneous atherosclerosis um, has, uh, it has developed. And um, this is my phylogeny that I've created just to kind of show um, the broadness of it. And there are some species um, uh, that we have greater human contact with and Consequently, um, we see more of it. Uh, so it's really not possible to talk about the incidence or the prevalence or anything because the, our sample size is representative, our sample is representative of, of the animals that we're encountering. And yet, there are things we can learn. Number one, captive animals seem to um, have higher rates, and that I'm saying with um, lots of modifiers, because we can't really say that, but we know that captive birds, for example, um, birds in zoos uh, tend to have particularly some species, quite a lot of atherosclerosis. In some cases, it actually can be their causes of death. They can have strokes and heart attacks, heart failure, etc. cetera. Um, so that already reinforces this idea that uh, lifestyle, you know, whether it's less activity and activity or diets, despite enrichment in zoos, which zoos do um, provide, that lifestyle really can drive disease. 
But even within those um, that these captive species who have athro, we see some species, uh, some avian species, who appear to have a greater um, tendency to develop athro than others. And as you probably can surmise, what I'm pointing to is the concept of natural animal models of enhanced vulnerability and potentially reduced vulnerability, even resistance. So this is um, um, a concept, but this idea of vulnerability to atherosclerosis based on species, that is based on an evolutionary characteristic, not based on lifestyle or one individual's um, uh, uh, practices, diets, is very disruptive of the traditional approach to atherosclerosis. What can we learn from thinking about and learning about the spontaneous occurrence of atherosclerosis in other species? Well, first, there's the potential to identify natural animal models. Second, we can begin understanding how lifestyle, how diets, how um, activity and other factors um, drive disease in other species. Um, there are differences that contain insights. And finally, and crucially, the presence of spontaneous atherosclerosis in whether it's zoo animals, but more um, specifically in wild species, and there are um, not a lot of cases in the peer-reviewed literature, but I've collected um, a, a significant number of them, uh, that the fact that atherosclerosis can develop spontaneously in wild species speaks to um, the possibility of environmental drivers of atherogenesis that may be um, happening in, human, in our human lives that are being eclipsed by lifestyles. Um, it may speak to um, the uh, underlying characteristics of atherogenesis that we've um, really not even considered, particularly what the evolutionary story of vulnerability is. That is, can vulnerability to atherosclerosis be conceived of as an evolutionary trait that represents a trade-off between um, uh, protection from some other process, potentially earlier in life, um, and balanced by atherosclerosis later in life. So these are all questions that are um, relevant and I think very rich, a rich source of insights, but have not been part of the human conversation at all. Well, um, there are other cardiovascular disorder, disorders, not just atherosclerosis, and um, I wanna just quickly show you how we can um, gain insights by thinking about spontaneous occurrence of other, of, uh, diseases and other species uh, for, for these um, disorders. So let's talk about why we are vulnerable as a, an evolutionary question, sort of looking for evolutionary insights, why, and particularly um, why we are vulnerable in this case to um, uh, a disease, it's a, it's a disorder rather, um, called vasovagal syncope, fainting. Um, and we're going to, I'm going to show you how by looking across species and, and evolutionary time, we can um, come up with an expanded understanding of, of why the causes of this form of fainting. So um, vasovagal fainting is um, the leading cause of fainting in, in people who are under the age of 50. And um, I taught the pathophysiology um, of cardiovascular disease course at UCLA for many years. And I used to describe this disorder as, um, as um, a paradoxical disorder uh, because uh, people faint typically um, when with vasovagal fainting when they are um, having fear, intense fear, or sometimes extreme pain. But in the case of fear, and, and of course, um, vasovagal fainting is what happens to, you know, uh, people when they're having their blood drawn or, you know, a, a, a first time father in the delivery suite. Um, but what happens paradoxically, as I used to say, is that with fear, one would expect a tachycardic response, an acceleration of the heart rate. But what happens instead is this paradoxical occurrence of bradycardia or a slowing of the heart rate. And that results in an inadequate amount of blood perfusing the brain, leading to fainting. 
Well, yes, it seems paradoxical because what could be what could be adaptive or healthy about fainting? Well, it's only paradoxical if you have a homo sapien centric lens. But as you um, expand that lens, um, which is what I did with one of the first studies that looked where I looked at this um, and asked the question, do other species um, ever have a slowing of the heart rate in response to fear, what is called alarm bradycardia in the veterinary literature? Sometimes there are these nomenclature differences across disciplines. I quickly learned that across a pretty wide range of taxa, and you can see the yellow stripes are uh, the occurrence of this phenomenon in the peer-reviewed literature in these species, that it's widespread, which argues for some evolutionary benefit. So it may be paradoxical for us, but is it conceivable that what we're seeing is activation of, of an ancient physiology that has been adaptive for animal ancestors for hundreds of millions of years and is retained in us in, in, us, in our 200,000 year old species? So um, one example of, of the kinds of studies that I found simply by doing searches and working with students um, and um, just kind of asking these questions. So years ago, um, telemetry studies, EKGs were put on young deer and, um, and then wolf howls were played to frighten the deer. And this is uh, actually the EKG. You can see that the heart rate's plummeting, really taking a nosedive. And this is what um, you see loss of motor tone, and I can't tell you that this is a, a fainting, a syncopal um, deer, but I can tell you that this deer is, is certainly immobile. And the adaptive hypothesis, of course, is that um, having a fear-initiated um, immediate abrupt bradycardia results in hypoperfusion of the brain, leading to fainting, and that motionlessness is an anti-predation um, strategy. Um, and this, don't worry, this has a happy ending. In the moments before this, this cheetah has taken down a, um, an impala and the hyena has stolen the, the goods, but watch the impala, boom. What is happening there is um, an example of tonic immobility and um, escape. So that's a pretty compelling evidence that tonic immobility whether this individual was bradycardic or not, I don't know the heart rate, is life-saving. Now, what about natural animal models of resistance? Again, in cardiovascular disease, there are opportunities to um, potentially identify natural animal models of resistance, but only if physicians are learning about veterinary science, are learning about animal health, physiology, are learning about ecology, are learning about the concept of life history of other species. So um, there are many examples, and I um, am actively um, interested in this and I'm working in this space right now um, on a, a couple of exciting uh, topics. But um, one that I'll, I'll very briefly share with you um, is, um, there we go, is, is very close to my heart because it is um, very much related to women's health. So um, the giraffe, um, the modern giraffe species, all of them, are, um, have um, some unique characteristics that um, may make them um, natural animal models of evolved resistance to something we call HEFPEF, which is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which um, has become the um, leading subtype of heart failure um, in women. And um, as our population ages, um, it will also soon be um, for men. Now, why do we develop heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Well, we do because so many of us humans have hypertension. We have high blood pressure as we get older. And as we um, develop high blood pressure, our left ventricles uh, have to work harder. And as a consequence, like any muscle working harder, our left ventricles start to thicken. But as they thicken, they stiffen. And so during the diastolic phase, the relaxation phase of the cardiac cycle, they, um, they don't expand properly and the pressure in our hearts is pushed into our lungs and we develop heart failure. Well, the giraffe um, is uh, unique in that its heart is meters from its brain. 
And the neonatal giraffe, um, the, the brain is not too far from the heart, and the neonatal, neonatal giraffe does not have, um, has a little bit of a thickened ventricle, but not significantly. But as the giraffe grows and um, the left ventricle has to work harder and harder as the neck lengthens, um, pushing the brain farther away, um, the ventricle thickens. And um, if you look at a, a giraffe necropsy, it looks, it looks like severe concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with a small cavity, which is jargon, cardiology jargon. But the point is, it really um, is an example of afterload induced, high blood pressure induced hypertrophy. Of course, it is developmental hypertrophy and it's not pathological, it's adaptive. Well, why am I suggesting that this is potentially an evolved adaptation that represents a natural animal model of resistance to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Because when my human patients develop left ventricular hypertrophy, they become short of breath for the reasons I just explained. They develop, they have fibrosis in their ventricles, their ventricles are sick, and some of my patients can't walk from the bed to their bathroom without short of breath, shortness of breath. And yet, you don't really need to do any studies at all to know that that is not the case. For the modern giraffe, who are giraffe are prey species. The significant cause of death for giraffes is predation. And they're not animals who are hiding, they're animals who are fleeing. And so the adaptive importance of um, evolving the ability to uh, have a ventricle that thickens but does not stiffen um, is real. And it's interesting because the giraffe um, and the modern okapi um, are the two species that share a common ancestor most recently. And um, some of the characteristics of, the, of giraffe hearts, uh, many of the ones that I'm interested in, do not exist in the okapi who doesn't have that long neck. So quickly, I, I want to um, leave time for questions, uh, so I will... Um, I'm going to quickly just talk about mental illness briefly, briefly. And I, I like to talk about mental illness because um, whatever disruption occurs when physicians think about atherosclerosis outside of the context of, of modern lifestyles, modern human lifestyles, mental illness, the challenges are um, orders of magnitude larger. And that I think largely has to do with not only human exceptionalism, but you know, centuries of, um, of assumptions about our, um, our unique cognitive and emotional abilities and ongoing debates until not too long ago about animal sentience and pain, etc. And so when it comes to mental illness, the, the barrier is higher, but I think the opportunity is potentially even greater because not only can we um, expand our understanding of cause and potentially identify natural animal models of vulnerability and resistance, I think we can use this perspective to fight stigma of mental illness in humans. Mental illness is not unique to our species, and that is a profound and important reality. Um, when I started writing Zubiquity with, with Catherine, um, we had not planned on including anything related to mental illness at all. Uh, in fact, I didn't even know that mental illness existed in other species. Um, I like to, maybe I shouldn't, but I like to sort of go back to how ignorant I was because um, I think I'm a pretty good barometer of where still many of my colleagues are. And it's the opportunity that is being missed is, is just, um, is, is tremendous. And so actually uh, the book ended up having um, half the chapters uh, focused on mental um, disorders or biobehavioral disorders. And um, of course, I think uh, many of us are now aware that there are many behavioral disorders that um, in other species that are related to human disorders. And I share these with my students. I teach um, large undergraduate courses at Harvard and at UCLA. I teach medical students, I teach residents and, um, and uh, physicians and, and nurses and um, others. But I, I like to share these uh, because some do and some don't know this, and, um, but it's important, I think. So starting with dogs is always a good um, entry level. Um, and 
the previous slide I was showing, you know, the characteristic um, tail chasing and, and this acrylic dermatitis, these compulsive syndromes in dogs. This is another compulsive syndrome um, in Doberman. Uh, this is flank sucking disorder. And um, you see this, this phylogeny that um, of, of dog breeds, and we know that there's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, we're going to be hearing more about that today um, from some real experts uh, to, to gain insights into human, into human um, disorders through the spontaneous occurrence of these problems in dogs. But beyond dogs, there are behavioral um, issues that are related to human disorders um, as well, of course. Uh, captive animals um, uh, do, can develop stereotypies. Uh, this is a very severe stereotypy um, in a bear. Um, this is a, a hair pulling orang. All these are captives, captive animals. But, um, but it's important, even as we're looking at this, to go back and um, remember that although captivity or bad captivity, and it's important because there are um, settings under human stewardship which, in which this does not occur and in um, environments where there is adequate enrichment and, and awareness and understanding. And there's such um, um, you know, a, a lot that environments can do, but, but even if environments can um, dial up the risk of these stereotypies, the essential neurobiology that underlies them evolved in natural settings. And that is an insight and an opportunity for um, scientific insight. So yes, lifestyle drives the risk of atherosclerosis, but the essential vulnerability exists, um, you know, almost existed, you know, over 435 million years ago, uh, based on the phylogeny. And while captivity dials up the risk, the essential vulnerability um, to these disorders um, is, is ancient. And that's a perspective that we don't usually take. There are um, eating uh, related issues, um, this um, regurgitation and, and um, reingestion that can occur um, in some animals, again, with, in captive settings, but again, in stressful captive settings, not in, in, um, not in all settings. I mean, enrichment helps. But the point is that this, this idea of, um, of self-induced vomiting as a stress reducer for animals, I think is very relevant and should be brought into the conversation of our understanding of, of eating disorders in humans. And of course, there's feather plucking disorder. Um, this is a bird on the left with beautiful plumage and you can see that the thorax of this bird on the right, um, um, she or he has plucked, um, plucked out all these feathers. And um, you know, I'm again, not making the case that this is an identical syndrome, but um, that's why I use the language disorders that are related or behaviors that are related. But trichotillomania, hair plucking in humans is, you know, a significant issue. Um, and I think there are some very um, powerful opportunities to ask fundamental questions about the mechanism, um, the developmental triggers, the, um, uh, and, and, and even um, the genetics, the, um, the, the environmental um, factors. And these are opportunities but they'll only be um, opportunities that are turned into um, you know, knowledge uh, if physicians are aware of this. Um, I want to end um, this uh, little portion by uh, sharing some recent work that I'm really interested in, which is looking at um, a broader way of understanding what are called child adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. And um, it's now well known, known that um, earlier life experiences, particularly adverse experiences, um, uh, are uh, drivers of and even predictors of um, mental health challenges and physical health challenges in later life. And I uh, became interested in, in uh, well, what about um, this kind of comparable idea in, in dogs, because we have most information about dogs. And um, so I put together, uh, this is, uh, and by the way, the second picture is um, supposed to be a, a, a you know dogs in, in bad settings. But I'm really talking about um, commercial breeding facilities um, and and other adverse situations. And so this is um, a life um, a, you know lifeline, a lifetime timeline rather of adverse early life experiences. And it's an interactive diagram I use with my students, where we just grab uh, you know take the literature um, and 
do a correlation. But I have actually done over the last several months the same thing for dogs. And, um, and of course, there are um, some parallels, but even just presenting this to groups of colleagues as a way of thinking about the concept of periods of developmental vulnerability um, and the spontaneous emergence of, in dogs, of anxiety disorder, um, aggression, um, and other um, um, psychopathologies that uh, are not only difficult for families in whom, uh, in whom these dogs are, are members, but can actually jeopardize the lives of these dogs if they are relinquished and euthanized. So there are just all these opportunities, but um, again, unrealized opportunities if we don't educate physicians about the spontaneous occurrence of these so-called human disorders in other species. And so I want to return back to Tracy and ask the question again, um, how far have we come? What do physicians know about the health of non-human animals? Um, and the answer is um, not enough, but, um, but more than before, and we need to uh, continue pushing that forward. Well, how can we make this happen? Well, I mentioned before that um, as I was writing the book, um, Catherine and I realized that one of the things we needed to do was to accelerate this if we could. And so we founded the Zubiquity Conferences. And uh, the first was in, at UCLA. Uh, we brought together UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, UCLA uh, School of um, Medicine. And uh, we had a conference which um, this was the handshake that I want to replicate. I wanted to replicate around the world and, and we have. It, it was um, the veterinary dean of Davis at that time and the dean of the medical school at that time shaking hands. And um, uh, here are some examples of what these conferences were. They've evolved since then. We would bring together a veterinary expert um, and human expert just to discuss a shared disease. So this is syncope, um, fainting in a horse and a high school athlete. And by the way, the, the goal here was to have an audience of half DVMs, vet students, and um, animal health professionals, and half MDs, medical students, um, nurses, and uh, etc. And um, really, but mostly to educate the physicians. Um, we did cardiovascular diseases, of course, mitral valve prolapse here in a ballerina and a, and a dog. Um, cancer, uh, this was acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and th this is just from our first event. Um, and uh, we did brain tumor, glioblastoma in um, animals and humans. And we did uh, biobehavioral. Um, I have wanted to make sure that we do biobehavioral in all of our conferences. Uh, and uh, we did, we have. So we don't neglect the uh, infectious diseases. Uh, we simply take the position that um, the connection between human and animal health extends far beyond zoonoses. And that by looking across species in evolutionary time, physicians can expand their understanding of, of the causes of these diseases and um, through collaboration, uh, spark innovation that can benefit not only human patients um, but all of the all of the species uh, the health of all the species on earth and um, hopefully by extension the health of the earth itself and so with that I'm going to close and I thank you for your attention and welcome questions thank you very much that was wonderful um, I will have a look at the Q&A box. Please submit more questions. Uh, we have a little bit of time to talk about um, this talk. And um, so there's one question that says, I have a question regarding how can we find natural models, for example, when we work uh, with lab and animals, especially when we deal with cancer in, in vitro models? Um, I hope I understand the questions correctly. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really present on cancer at all. I, we, um, I teach a course where we focus on, on heart disease and cancer. And I'm not an expert on in vitro models and, um, and lab animal medicine. Um, but my, my feeling is that everyone involved with investigation um, needs to um, expand our, um, our knowledge of these related fields. There are 
there is missing connective tissue um, between not only the field of veterinary medicine and human medicine, but um, across fields of investigation. And the integration of information that's happening in labs with um, what's happening not only clinically, but um, environmentally um, is, is, is lacking. And so uh, what I hope to do is to spark not only collaboration between veterinary and human medicine, but to really expand everyone's um, awareness of the interconnectedness of all of these um, issues that we study, and especially to frame what we're seeing in the lab, what is seen um, in vitro uh, in the context of a broader story of evolution, of environment. And, um, and so my mission is, um, in that capacity, is to really um, increase um, awareness. What I do, what I am working on now is um, finding, developing strategies to identify um, species with potential natural um, animal, with, with, with physiologies that may represent evolved adaptations, which are natural animal models. Um, but my approach is to use phylogeny and life history characteristics. Okay, um, another question. So you, um... You emphasized on the factor that um, you know those non-communicable communi communicable diseases um, are very much due to the way we live. Um, so our lifestyle factors, food, exercise, uh, and so forth. And you you think it's still a very good uh, yeah opportunity to compare to other species. So what's your experience there? Um, because it looked like you worked a lot with zoo animals and um, it, it, it seems to make more sense than because in the wild, for example, um, disorders like mental disorders or stereotypical behavior is not that common as you would see in, in a zoo environment. Um, so do we have to study animals in captivity to make this comparison? Right, so I think that the, the, the opportunity is um, in order to realize this opportunity, we need to um, reconsider how we understand vulnerability to disease. So it's not surprising maybe that captive animals have higher rates of atherosclerosis. Okay, but when we hear about atherosclerosis in a wild animal, that's disruptive, right? It feels, so I think the question is, um, I think the real insight is to break apart what happens to one individual in their lifetime as a form of vulnerability to the evolutionary story of trade-offs and adaptations leading to a species whose phenotype includes vulnerability to disease, to atherosclerosis. So where's the opportunity for study? Well, it's everywhere but it depends on what kind of studying um, we're interested in. So for example, um, am I suggesting that we study you know, zoo animals? No, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that in the, you know, to the to exclusion of, of other animals, but right now that information is what is available. We don't have a lot of information about the, um, the comorbidities, that is what wild animals, whether, how many wild animals, what species, when, how often atherosclerosis occurs. Um, and what is where, where I get um, excited and um, frustrated is that there are these statements that, um, oh, this never occurs in the wild, or that never occurs in the wild. And it's, um, the statements are made and they're repeated as an echo chamber in part as an indictment of human culture and lifestyle and practices. And I agree with that. We have very unhealthy, very, very, very unhealthy lifestyles and practices and environments. And that's a big piece of this as well. But, but the point is, um, is that even without those influences, that vulnerability would be there. And so, um, what we have not been thinking about or looking at <clears throat> vulnerability from that perspective. So that's where I see this opportunity. Now, what can we learn? Well, number one, if there is enhanced vulnerability, then we have a natural animal model of enhanced vulnerability. And we can look at the animal in its 
context in its ecology, looking at its life history um, to understand it. If there's an animal who seems to have less and that we don't right now have a way of knowing that, then we're looking at potential species with resistance. And that too can provide insights such as, um, such as the giraffe. So um, it's, it, it's not, I don't have a, a roadmap for right now how to answer these questions. But I do know that a first and important first step is to begin separating how we understand causation. Okay, there's another question. Um, one, someone asks, in terms of adverse childhood experiences, do you think epigenetic modifications are a main driver? And do you think the mechanisms, uh, mechanism is conserved across a species? Uh, yeah, I mean, th that's, that's really what I'm absolutely fascinated by. Yeah, my hypothesis is that there is some conservation of the, um, the timing of these developmental windows of vulnerability. Um, and I certainly, I think there is, it's likely that, you know, epigenetic influences are, you know, are triggering this or, or you know, cause, so, so called causing it. But um, it's exciting to think about these developmental windows and potential commonalities in an evolutionary context. So instead of saying, which is how we typically say it in medicine, we say, ah, these, you know, during early life or gestation or, or neonatal life or during adolescence, there's this, you know, um, brain plasticity. And as a consequence, if there's adverse experience, there's going to be pathology later. Yes, that's the observed phenomenon and, and that has very significant relevance. But the evolutionary story that underlies that, and the question is why? Why are those periods, um, why is there such plasticity? And then we can actually look at the life history of these animals to see what the important teaching is that may um, uh, be occurring during these phases. And how can we take um, sort of a pathological frame and begin to understand opportunities to enhance health by identifying um, uh, uh, these potentially conserved periods of plasticity. So it's, it's giving a context for why. And um, that's more than just saying, ah, this is what we see, but ah, this is why. It's important for animals if they do have you know, a, a, a terrifying experience with predators early in life. It's important that that, through epigenetic mechanisms, modifies their hypervigilance or temperament or behavior um, later, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's reframing vulnerability in the context of an evolutionary story. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That was very, very interesting. And yeah, maybe also that, that's something that, that struck me um, when you think about yeah, our um, fellow um, animals um, we live with, either in, they are in captivity or like in our care or in the wild, we all have the problem that we live in a rather polluted environment by now. So I guess that's a that's a big factor. And I hope, I really hope that the yeah the medical community is trying to also lobby for that and um, is doing something for that because yeah, at the moment you can say um, in why like uh, air pollution is a huge problem also for COVID nineteen and uh, it looks like um, in the US. Um, regulations are, you know, lowered instead of um, enforced, which is kind of uh, shocking. So yeah, prevention uh, to all those diseases seems to be key. Thank I just want to, yeah, can I just say that I just to, to go off that for a second, that is such an important point, because um, we know that environment is conservatively um, responsible for at least 25% of NCDs in humans. And increasingly, as we are, are, are environments are overlapping with animals, both in terms of um, the explosion of, you know, interest in domestic animals, but also obviously um, the overlap in wild and, and human environments as that is, as the exposomes of humans and non-human animals become increasingly overlapping. Um, and the, the emergence of NCDs and other species takes on really unprecedented, unprecedented salience for human health. Yeah. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, I, we have some more questions we couldn't get to. Maybe we can forward them to you. I don't know if you have time, but um, also your book is um, 
available, of course, so people can read more um, about your work. Thank you very much.